All right, let's see here. Let's just take all this, all this garbage off of here. It's just nah, just nah, nah. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stay tuned. Are we all clear? Oh, okay, we're all clear. Great. All right, hit the red button. No! Ho, ho, ho! Merry fucking Christmas! Welcome to Nikatsu Christmas in July. It's... I don't have a watch on right now, but I'm pretty sure it's the, like the last day of July. But that's okay. That's fine. We're, we're good. We're good. We're fine. We're good. How's my audio looking? Hot as fuck! All right, Nakatsu Christmas in July, baby. Bum, 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 bum. I don't know any Christmas tunes off the top of my head because it's really hot in my office. I don't have the air conditioning on because ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -bum, it hits the microphone directly. All right, yeah, it, it's Christmassy. You know, I got I got Uncle Jess up here. I got Black Santa Claus. I got a star. Christmas! Come on! Ah, I couldn't find the lights. All right, let's do some stuff. So, I bought 16 Nakatsu Roman pornos from a half-off sale over on oldies.com. Now, seeing as how I like to do big dumb bullshit and completely upturn all other plans I have for both my channel and my life, I figured I should celebrate this purchase with a video. And that that's why you're here. So we're doing Nakatsu Christmas in July. Let's do it! Roll the thing! Say Christmas in July. I hope that cover. I hope, I hope that you know. I hope that covers it for you. Okay, so uh, before we get started, look at all this smut. Look at all this. Look at all this fucking smut. This is a lot of smut. Look at that. That's a lot of smut right there. Holy sweet merciful, merciful fuck bags. It's a lot of smut. And we got all kinds of smut. We got Momo's lips. We got sexual assault at a hotel. We've got a uh, nurse girl dorm, sticky fingers, which I assume stars Blade. Blade, the series. Some things are better left dead. We've got Sex Hunter 1980, in case you needed a, a, a fresher approach to the sex hunting. <laughs> You've got female teacher, dirty afternoon, female teacher, hunting. Woman in a Box, Virgin Sacrifice Edition. Uh, Arrow School Feels So Good. I know for a fact that's not the, the proper title. Uh, Horny Diver, Tights Shellfish. Mmm, tasty. Uh, story of a White Coat, I I Indecent Axe. We've got Nurse Diary, Wicked Finger, woman, Women in Prison, Assault 13th Hour, She Cat, I Love It From Behind, Fairy in a Cage, Zoom Up. Zoom up, beaver book girl, sex hunt the wet target, love hunter. I'm gonna have to restack those. Feliz Navidad. I wanna wish you a horny Christmas. I wanna wish you a horny Christmas. I wanna wish you a horny Christmas from the bottom of my penis. All right. So first up, let's talk about, I love it. Fuck! I love it from behind. Hiya! Look, man, I'm only flesh and blood. You give me a title like this, it's not even open yet. <laughs> Opening my presents. Ah! This is how I spend my time. I'm 33 and married with a child, but I talk to a camera in my hot office. I talk to a camera in my hot office. Now's a good time to mention that this video has an extended cut of 
however many minutes are on screen over on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Michael Keen, where you can get all sorts of fun uh, written reviews and also uh, extended uncut videos about movies like I, I love it from behind exclamation point. You give me a title like I love it from behind and buddy this thing this thing jumps to the top of the queue before the exclamation point can be read. The plot of From Behind, um, excellent From Beyond porno parody title, by the way, uh, centers on three young women who are all staying in the same apartment for about a month. During that time, all three must contend with their own sexual challenges, some of which proving to be a little more Olympian than others. It's also the kind of film with transitions like this. cinema. Who fucking edited this? Stelma Schumacher? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> the reason that the toilet water is black is because it's full of ink that was pissed out of Mime's vagina. Because in the scene prior, a dude with a cock covered in ink screwed her brains out without cleaning the ink off his cock, which had been put there by Mime for an art project. I should back up. <laughs> yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Real quick, let me introduce you to the three broads at the center of this film and their quirks. This is Mime Mizaki. She's ostensibly the lead character, although it all does wind up being a bit of an ensemble. She's played by Junko Asahina. You're also gonna have to give me a little bit of leeway with these names. I am, I did start du Japanese Duolingo specifically for this kind of bullshit, but I, look, I am the whitest man alive. That's why we're on in the mornings. <laughs> anyway, Junko Asahina, who has one hell of a CV. She was in the Paul Nashi joint, The Beast and the Magic Sword, future demonetized review subject, Rape Man 1, and even has a role in at least one Hisiyasu Sato joint, Soft Skin. Expect to see plenty more of her as we continue our uh, smutcation in Pinkville. <laughs> we'll not be reviewing Barbie. Now, if you're wondering to yourself, does she take pride in what she does? Yep, quite the hobby. That's a, that's a lot of dicks. Uh, we learn shortly thereafter while she's meeting her new roommates that her goal is to sleep with 100 men and get a penis print from each for her collection, which, you know, sure. Uh, the impetus for this adventure is her impending arranged marriage, which she doesn't seem too concerned about beyond the fact that it it's happening soon and she still needs to hit that magic number. Uh, now moving on, this is Rei. She was Mime's classmate in high school and I fucking love her. Rei is fantastic and her actress, Yumi Hayakawa, has a fantastic screen presence. Unfortunately, she only has six listed credits on IMDb with this and Security Rope Discipline being the most notable. And all those credits are from 1980 and 1981. So she had a brief spurt of a career and then I guess nothing. A cursory Google search doesn't reveal much, but that's not helped by the fact that she has a pretty common name. Uh, point being, I was really hoping to see her in more, but I turned up borderline zilch. This has been a pointless diversion. Ray's whole deal is that she can't have sex with men. In fact, she can't even stand to be touched by a man or else she breaks out in freaking hives. I love it from behind first broaches this topic when a man touches her shoulder just to get her attention, causing her to start scratching almost immediately. This conundrum is thanks to a male coworker who convinced her that he was a chill dude before turning the tables and, well, doing a Care Bear stare on her. Now, more specifically, he shaves her pubes and stuffs a dildo up her butt. This leads directly into part two of the most uncomfortable portion of I Love It From Behind. There's this pervading idea throughout the film that getting a dick in the ass will turn a man gay, which honestly ain't too bad for films of this time period, especially in Japan. <laughs> Uh, although, to be fair, this is the same country that gave us several excellent gay pinku flicks, so there were some reparations to be had. Just to add wood to the fire, Ray's co-worker Kimura is getting back into town soon, adding some anxiety to her men problem. Kimura, by the by, is played by female beautician Rope Discipline and tattooed flower vase actor Shinsho Nakamura. He shows up in another Nikatsu production in this series of discs. Uh, female gym coach Jump and Straddle, also starring Junko Asahina. There is a power dynamic 
aspect to this relationship that could be explored since Kimura is described as a corporate high roller, but it really isn't. Uh, I do think it's an intention of the filmmakers, and perhaps from a Japanese perspective, it might even seem extraneous to go any further, but that particular aspect never comes up. He's just the boss, or a boss, or at least someone higher up in the corporate ladder who nice guys his way into Ray's pants before shaving her and sticking a dildo up her back door. Tale as old as time. Actually, in this case, I guess it really is a tale as old as time. Gosh, ain't dudes the worst. And finally, meet Masumi Morimoto. Uh, she's the closest thing we get to an audience surrogate in that she's seemingly just here to get some introductions in and insert foreign objects into her vagina. Masumi's whole thing is that she's never been with a man, and in the film's biggest departure from reality, she actually has a hard time trying to find a Japanese dude who will have sex with her. It's fiction, guys. At one point, she's literally walking the streets of Tokyo at night, asking random passers-by if they'll fuck her. She even asks the cameraman. <laughs> Matsumi is played by Marie Kishida, and if it tells you anything, this is the highest film by popularity on her letterbox. She has five credits in total, at least that are listed, ranging from 1980 to 1982, including From the Back or From the Front, Gynecology Ward, Caress Me Tenderly, and Zoom Up, Seiko's Thigh which we'll probably cover in this series as well. You know what, screw it. The other one is Female Teacher's Awakening. There, now you, now you know her entire filmography. You're an expert. Like with Hayakawa, there's not really anything else available after a cursory search about what happened with Marie Kishida. Uh, neither of these is terribly surprising, of course. A lot of these movies used actresses with extremely brief careers, uh, with plenty being one and done. Smaller productions, like those from Pinku Pioneer Koji Wakamatsu, even used non-actors, not because they were Brechtian or anything, but because they just didn't have any fucking money. Now that said, while Nakatsu Roman pornos were certainly cheaper than mid- Ugh, oh god, indigestion. Uh, that said, while Nakatsu Roman pornos were certainly cheaper than many other productions from the studio, it's always a little frustrating to find solid actors who just kind of disappear. Um, Anyway, we'll, we'll see how much more often that happens as we delve through more smut. Masumi is Rei's lesbian lover, which kind of makes sense of the whole no dicks in that pussy thing. All three sort of go their separate way. Hmm, progressive. All three sort of go their separate ways once things start heating up. Mime and Rei go to a bar to get Mime some cock specimens, and that's where we meet two notable characters. The first is Bunta, or, um... Gay Bunta. <laughs> gay Bunta isn't technically gay, but instead is a cross-dresser who runs, or works at, I'm not entirely clear, a bar called One Shot, named as such because of all the casual sex on offer there. Uh, Bunta is an old friend of Ray's and essentially is just there to push the plot along. Fuck Mime, uh, thereby extending the plot by getting in the way of a conquest. And, um, be a gay joke. <laughs> The other character is Fukami, who I might add uh, had me a tad surprised the second time through, as I had thought he was introduced much later in the film. However, he's here right in the at the like tinnish minute mark, albeit without his trademark stylish glasses, which he wears in his second appearance twenty minutes later. For a second, I thought I was just hella racist, but no, that's him. Same same guy, not a racist. Ignore Black Santa. Come the back half of the film, he's Mime's white whale, a man who is elusive, not immediately charmed by her carefree, sexually liberated self, and who fancies himself a bit of an expert lover. He even lifts weights with his cock. He's played by Kazuhiko Ishida, another actor with next to nothing on his CV and who is also in Female Gym Coach, Jump and Straddle. Um, that one was also released in 1981 and directed by Koyu Ohara, uh, who not only directed this film, but also such titles as Fairy in a Cage and White Rose Campus. Then everybody gets ra- That's the title. Which, like... I'm super excited for Female Gym Coach. Anyway, his plot with Mime leads to a phenomenal third act set piece, wherein the two of them have marathon sex and prove to one another just how great they are at the art of fucking. Uh, it's a lot of fun and leads to several strong punchlines. Basically, that's how I love it from behind goes. Three ladies in the big city contending with their own sexual journeys. The dick virgin wants dick. The assault victim needs to push past her fear of men. And the dick print chick um, needs a full set of dick prints, uh, I guess. 
And hey, to be fair, not a bad conflict for one of these films. 100 dick prints? You do you, girl. Obviously, she does get a more concrete goal in Fukami, but narratively, it's not as strong as Ray's revenge plot. That said, it works really well as a sort of frat house storyline with a small Japanese girl in place of the frat boy. Girl just wants to fuck 100 dudes and meets the one stud who's not so easy. It's cute, and though it threatens several times to take the more well-trod pinky path, it keeps things restrained and light. For this genre, anyway. It's actually, it's... That, that final marathon is a very funny sequence. So, hey, light comedy. In fact, it's the virgin plot that holds the least amount of interest. It's mostly just an excuse for her to fuck various foreign objects in lieu of a dude, which is fine and all, but doesn't hold a candle to the other two plots. And no, you perv, she doesn't fuck a candle. Come to think of it, Masumi's plot is weirdly progressive, considering, spoiler, she never makes it with a dude and instead finds solace in objects. How this corresponds with Rei's more SM flavored character arc is up to your imagination, since that is also not explored in this 67 minute movie. Also, the title is hilarious in full context. You'd think this would be a movie about anal sex at the forefront, and it is in a very unexpected way for this genre. I Love It From Behind is, it's a funny, lighthearted Roman porno romp with a few spicy nuggets thrown in because, well, Japan. Round one. One thing I neglected to mention is that the cinematography is top notch. Nebumasa Mitsuno? Mitsuno? Yeah. Took on DP duties here, and he's another one we'll be seeing a lot more of. His other work includes Fairy in a Cage, Beautiful Teacher in Torture Hell, Angel Guts, Red Classroom, Zoom Up, The Beaver Book Girl, Horny Diver Tight Shellfish, Momo's Lips, and Female Gym Coach, Jump and Straddle. Okay, I really need to see this movie. Next time, baby. So, one down. Next up, we've got Sex Hunter. Wet. Why is it at the bottom? Okay. Just... Fuck. Sex Hunter Wet. God damn it. I also did not open this one. Sex Hunter Wet. Fucking sh Oh, by the way, these do come with little essays in them from Jasper Sharp, who, uh, he was the guy who wrote the literal book on Pinku Ega, Behind the Pink Curtain. Uh, they don't all come with essays from him, but they do say in the uh, special features whether or not they do. Um, they do all, however, come with product catalogs. So, Sex Hunter, wet target. Now this one I have previously watched, um, and it's a hoot and a half. Let me tell ya. <laughs> Unlike our previous Roman porno, this one is extremely dark in its storytelling while also being completely fucking batshit. It's also kind of a black exploitation film. Our protagonist, Haruhiko Okamoto, pretty much the walking thesis statement for Antihero, is a half Japanese, half black convict played by Joji Sawada. While he's in prison, Okamoto's sister, Natsuko, is raped, strangled, and hanged by a group of American GIs. I really need to stop saying the R word because while this is not going to get monetized, I really don't need YouTube on my ass anymore. So let's, um, we're going to, for you guys who are new to these videos, um, the R word is handily replaced by Care Bear Stairs because I don't know, that's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, anyway, Natsuko is Care Bear Stared, strangled, and hanged by a group of American GIs. Don't worry, kiddo. We get a flashback for all the gory details. Not much of a mystery here. Shortly after this event, we get a flashback to the circumstances of Okamoto's imprisonment. Seems he had the misfortune of being chained to a group of fellow prisoners who managed to escape from a prison bus uh, after he was, you know, given basically like a misdemeanor or something. Our boy and company are easily captured and sent back to prison. From there, we are immediately placed in a tale of vengeance as Okamoto's sentence ends two years after his sister's death and he hits the streets and the sheets uh, to track down and murder the ever-loving shit out of those responsible. Of course, these things are never simple, and it turns out that there's more to this brutal crime than meets the eye. Okamoto's methods are striking in their brutality. While he's driven by the idea of avenging his sister, his mind has been molded into a vehicle for rage. While there's no doubt that his sister's death is heartbreaking and important to him, 
you can't help but wonder just how much of that is fueling him when one of his first actions post-prison is throat-fucking a random woman in the company of a guy who's a racist D-bag as he's walking by. So uh, here's how it started. And here's how it's going. Yeah, uh, he's he's a bad dude. Um, but as in many of these films, he's the least bad dude in a cast made up almost entirely of bad dudes. So he's our version of a good guy. Of course, the reason here probably isn't very altruistic. Methinks the production just needed a, a reason to have a woman get throat fucked before spitting out an outrageous amount of cum because it was that time in the movie. Uh, it also helps that our lead is the subject of racist ridicule and commodification for a good chunk of the runtime, uh, which he inevitably uses as a tool on his path to vengeance. He's a simple-minded dude, ignorant to things like live sex shows and incredulous at the idea of overtime, and so his being thrust into the former is a natural path. Honestly, it's a pretty smart way of getting the audience from point A to point fuck. It is funny how easily our guy just kind of stumbles his way into a new career as a live sex act. It's almost a hand wave. The girl's partner is sick. Oh, hey, this half black bartender dude could probably fill in. Sure, why not? Oh, wow, he's really good at this. Of course, there, uh, this new occupation, which he is unsurprisingly, again, naturally great at, uh, leads him directly into the solution to Natsuko's mysterious death. It's not the least likely course of action since he gets his initial bartending gig at the same bar where she had worked, but it's almost comical how quickly he winds up in the lion's den. Bad guys are practically lining up to tango with this guy. Now, being 1972, there's still some experimental bullshittery on display, left over from the French New Wave-influenced early days of the pink film. This would never go away entirely, but it's always charming to get a choppy edit of a hanged nude body appearing and disappearing. That's... That's just cinema. A little over halfway through, we get a great fight between Okamoto and dickhead pimp Taki, uh, the incredibly prolific Nakatsu regular Akira Takahashi, by the way, uh, whom we met earlier during the throat fucking incident. Small world. They barrel through occupied bedrooms, tearing the place up in a violent beatdown that feels more like a rite of passage than a battle born of anger, although it is definitely that too. Uh, this is another point in which Okamoto just kind of stumbles into the next chunk of plot, leading him to the villains he's destined to murder. Now, lazy writing aside, this is an enjoyable, blunt instrument revenge spectacle. Uh, every male character is a complete piece of shit, but at least our protagonist has a defined reason for his depravity. It's not a lot, but it's something in this nihilistic hellscape. Interesting. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> All right, next. All right. Easy enough, fairy in a cage. Uh, now I brought this one up a much already, so let's dig into a classic you've probably heard of if you also love fuck smut or have been watching this video. 1977's fairy in a cage. I actually need to put that. A film that dares ask the question, but what if you felt really bad at the end? I wasn't entirely sure what to expect with this one. Sure, it has Naomi Tani, and I've seen the poster, so the general binding agreement between film and audience has been signed. However, I wasn't aware of anything else about the film. Zilch, nada, nil. Shock and awe, it's not a happy picture. Basically, we've got a judge with a mighty big head on his shoulders who uses his military-backed power to do basically whatever he wants. You might say he's perverting his position. It's torture, he tortures women. Not to spoil anything, but this is from the opening credits. So yeah, not exactly a mystery at play here. Pretty much immediately, we are dropped into World War II era Japan, where the state is fascist AF fam. The corrupt judge uh, overseeing the impending capture of a political activist, uh, becomes infatuated with the wife of a wealthy jeweler. Shock and awe, the wife is played by Naomi Tani, and so it once again is not that hard to tell where things are going. You see Naomi Tani in a movie, she's gonna get tied up and beaten. Not bad for a 
day in the life of a dog food company. The judge will soon have to give up his current favorite interrogation subject and needs a replacement ASAP. And though his chosen victim is deemed an unlikely prisoner, well, you miss every shot you don't take, I guess. <laughs> Once the judge brings in Naomi Tani's Kimiko and fascisms his way into justifying her arrest and torture, an event that basically just falls into his lap, what follows is, well, a lot of torture. After a final round with his former plaything, including a mid-credits enema, Natch, our little judgy wudgy is ready to move on to his new toy. Ain't that the law for you? Which, by the way, credit where credit is due. The pacing on this one is bananas. Uh, by the end of the opening credits, we know exactly how this film views wartime Japan and fascist police states, and we get a fine mix of torture, torture, ruminations on ACAB, and um, torture. Oh, and some violence. Also pee. Real, real, real thirst quencher, this one. Uh, I was never disturbed, per se, by the torture in Fairy in a Cage. I've seen just too much horse-related assault in the Sado oeuvre to get bothered by peeing into a bowl or white itch cream that makes you want to fuck or this thing that's impeccably shot. Looks painful, but symmetry. Teoka, uh, our sort of audience surrogate get out of jail free card, is a recently transferred member of the military police who is immediately caught off guard by the brutal tactics of the judge and his men. He's not the most brilliantly rendered moral center in the world. He pretty quickly succumbs to being a man and starts lusting after the prisoner as well and even gets caught jerking it while thinking of her in the shower. But he helps to keep things from transitioning into impenetrable darkness. In the third act, he does what he needs to do in order to get us where we need to go. But again, I'll let you be as surprised as you can be when you check out Fairy in a Cage. Surprise not guaranteed. Like with many films in this dank corner of the cinemaverse, the use of a relative moral center is just a way of skirting past all other morality and having a time of it. This is definitely a film you're supposed to be getting off to, and you know, with how big political entertainment is now, I can, I, I can certainly see how you might also get off on being morally superior to these, um, rapists. <laughs> But hey, is that such a bad thing? After all, this is a fantasy and one that, to be totally fair, does present a critical look at these villains. There's clever presentation here. When interrogating the actor who has also been arrested, our fascists point to, to incredibly far-fetched reasons to hold him, including a photo that shows he was in elementary school with a notable protester. Still, it's very obviously a false pretense. We're not here for morality. We're here to see Naomi Tani tied up with a rope. In that regard, Fairy in a Cage does not disappoint. Now, like all Nakatsu productions, there's a lot of visual opulence on display with just about every frame perfectly filled out with typically four individual quadrants of interest that all work to guide the viewer toward the subject. Admittedly, that subject is a naked Naomi Tani tied up with a rope, so we're grading on a curve here, but still, it's a great selection of sumptuous cinematography and torture. <laughs> All that aside, um, I don't know, man. It's another Roman porno with a, a far bigger cruel streak than I than uh, I love it from behind, and less of the campy nihilism of Sex Hunter Wet Target, but more of a solidified style and narrative than either. Its views on fascism are transparent, but still provide a strong support structure for a beautiful and fucked up experience. It's uh, so far, it's actually my favorite. Um, great little film about fascism and uh, tying up titties. Let's see. Zoom up murder site. Zoom up murder site. Zoom up. There it is. I feel like I should have turned this cover around before starting this. Oh, well. Zoom up murder site. Uh, <laughs> zoom up uh, Care Bear Stare site. Fuck it. Well, I'll use the name that's on the, the other side of the cover. Uh, zoom up murder site. But trust me, that's not the proper title for the film. Although it it does match the content. And hey, I, again, I am only human. And therefore a sucker for such an exploitative title. Like, I, I was all a quiver, legs spread wide, ready to get choked the second I saw this title. Uh, as a side note, I, I wrote this 
as a post for my delectable patrons. After seeing Barbie, that Greta Gerwig directed dissection of feminism, male fragility, and coping with the unrelenting river of time is pretty good, but it's no zoom up rape site. I said I wasn't gonna review Barbie, fuck. I should also probably note that I saw Barbie straight and I saw zoom up high on the edibles. Anyway, one of my favorite aspects of this journey through the Pinkuverse is how surprising it can be as a genre. Part of that obviously has to do with Pinku Ega and in turn the Nakatsu Roman Porno not really being genres of their own, but rather highly specific containers for genre. Like an MKV or MP4 or AVI or XVID. I'm getting in the weeds. Point being, it's a fascinating journey going from, oh, sex torture movies, to, oh, this thing's a fucking giallo? Yes, sir. Believe it or not, Zoom Up, murder site, is essentially just a Japanese distillation of an Italian murder mystery. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Zoom Up is less a mystery with a big twist than it is a disturbing character study wrapped in horror thriller clothing, which, I mean, does put it in line with quirky giallo luminaries like Death Laid an Egg and The Possessed, or... Uh, Luigi Bazzoni's other borderline giallo footprints on the moon, and I could certainly see a facsimile of this story being sold as a yellow paperback in 60s Rome, so very much in the general sphere. Um, unrelated side note, uh, Giolo uh, Questi, Giolo Questi, however the fuck you say his name, uh, wrote The Possessed before writing and directed Death Laid an Egg, so like, fucking legend. He has such a small filmography filled with gems that I really need to do a deep dive on him sometime, instead of, you know, all the smut. Anyway, Murder Sight uh, tells the story of Kentaro, uh, played by Takeshi Shimizu, who really wants to bone Tomoko, played by Arena Mie, whom uh, we'll be seeing more of. Just trust me on that. And she is the stepmom of this girl that he's tutoring. And wouldn't you know it, Curly over here gets his wish. Shocking thing for a porno, I know. But before that, he displays a shocking disposition for sexual assault when the stepmom initially spurns his advances. But then when he lets up at her request, she asks him to let her walk him to the train since she has shopping to do. Yeah, I, I think we all know what kind of shopping she has in mind. And so our fuckboy Kentaro, who uh, decides to take a little detour to an overgrown abandoned collection of buildings, where a serial murder took place years before, by the way. You know, it could be said that he at least wasn't inviting the pretense of some different outcome, but... Yeesh. Yeesh. Anyway, he takes her to this, these buildings, and... Um... <laughs> Wow. While this little drama is unfolding, there's also a sex murderer on the loose, and he wears black gloves, snatch, and the two plots converge when a woman named Fumio, uh, played by Yoko Azusa, uh, and her boss Hiroshi, played by Kazuo Sataki, uh, show up to bang in the same creepy room. Much like Tomoko, Fumio wants to be treated in a violent way, although with some foreplay which she requests just before asking him to cut his fingernails, and invites him to choke her. But, uh-oh! He does too good of a job and winds up strangling her to death while asking her to marry him. Talk about a sour lunch break. Uh, so he freaks out, dumps her body in an old elevator shaft, not realizing that he's got two offbeat lovers witnessing the entire act. What a pickle. Ah, but just to add more complications, when Hiroshi gives Fumio the shaft, he notices another body that she's landed on. What a pickle. Now, as the film goes on, we find out more and more about our characters. Tomoko's former boss turned husband is introduced, interesting parallel to the dynamic of murder and victim, by the way, and our dear killer finds himself being slowly driven mad over his crime and is apparently far more of a loser than we could have initially guessed. But you can ignore the wife once assault element of the plot, which if you've watched a few of these movies, then you probably can, uh, then what we have here is a very mature take on the genre without going to the extremes of, say, uh, Sion Sono's Anti-Porno, which is a meta-exercise from when Nikatsu tried rebooting the Roman porno series. This is way more of a giallo than it is softcore porn, but with some shockingly erotic moments spread throughout. Uh, there's some strong smut here, basically. If, again, you can push past the violent fantasy at the center. Which brings up an interesting question with these films. 
When does the fantasy breach viewer sensibilities? We live in a time where fantasy is more and more an accepted part of very real relationships, bondage being the obvious example. But these fantasies often are distillations of violent acts given permission by the subjugated partner. In the real world, this is all pretty simple. You get a safe word or share a common understanding of consent and when it can be revoked. If a film is fantasy though, is it necessary to include consent to a violent act? Is the film being a fantasy, and in this case made to fulfill carnal desires, given a past to present these as actual crimes? My mind leans to no, since by definition this is a fantasy made for adults to engage with, and even within the context of this particular film, there's very little actual assault. It's really just called that, but they're literally asking for it. Um, not the chick at the beginning, though. She, get, she gets Care Bear stared to, sh to death. So, Anyway, what about those who might watch these and not understand the need for consent? I often wonder how big an issue this could be. There's no doubt that people do commit crimes based on fiction they've seen, but is that just an excuse for a troubled mind that would have done something similar either way? I think so, but in these extreme instances, it's tough to really reach a conclusion. It doesn't bother me that consent isn't granted in a lot of these films. You could even argue that by signing the contract to be in the film, the actors are giving their consent, thereby negating any further explanation in film. I'm getting in the weeds again. Let's get let's get back to the movie. Uh, if there's one major flaw to be found in Murder Sight, it's how disinterested the filmmakers are in the mystery of the killer. Since they have to get their mandated sex scenes in, the writer is driven to focus more on the three central characters and how they interact and are affected by the killings. Now this is actually a positive, but what happens is a convoluted series of chance encounters that strain credulity. This all leads to an ending that, for those looking to be shocked by a surprise reveal, will be extremely disappointed. However, if you are enamored with our characters and how these events change them, uh, then you should be fine. It's even a film that invites rewatches. Basically, don't go in expecting things to end in a neat way. Do expect copious amounts of assault, and you should be good. And as you can see from the clips, this is yet another very well shot Roman porno thanks to DP Yonezo Meira and director Koyo Ohara who also directed I Love It From Behind and Fairy in a Cage. Uh, Meta doesn't top anything from Fairy, but this is still a visually crafty little minx, and it's no surprise that Meta was also on cinematography duties on Sweet Home and several uh, Juzo Itami films, including A Taxing Woman, Minbo, The Gentle Art of Japanese Extortion, and uh, The Funeral. Oh, and Seijun Suzuki's Pistol Opera. Dude's got a hell of a pedigree, and part of that pedigree is freaking zoom up re murder site. What a time to be alive. Moving on, let's talk about another film in the zoom up um, franchise. Can I show this on YouTube? Yeah, it's probably fine. That's the ticket. Uh, I'm so fucking sweaty. This is the hottest. Oh my God. Hey guys, check out my beaver book. Only a few more until I complete my collection. At first, it seems uh, this will finally be our venture into pure non-subversive sleaze. There's an opening assault sequence, you know, to get you in the mood, that suggests we're in for some really brutal shit. In actuality, it's kind of funny. Not the assault, but, you know, the, the rest of it. Beaver Book Girl follows three sorta of roommates who work for the same Beaver Book, a skin mag that features, well, you know. Right off the bat, I'm intrigued. I love when movies are about the actual porn industry, and in this case, it's a specialized field in a country with an oftentimes bizarre and conflicted relationship with sexual content. Uh, it's also yet another Nikatsu joint that's at least somewhat self-aware in its approach, and it feels as though the filmmakers may have very well been in these pornographer's shoes at some point in the not-too-distant past. Early on, they receive a bundle of money at their house, which this chick, Mako, wants to keep and, um, put in the bank. Hmm. While Koichi wants to call the police. Uh, Kimura, their photographer boss, seems to have other interests in mind and soon we find out why. While shooting Mako, peeing in a precarious position, someone throws cash at her. Though they don't see who did it, Kimura thinks he knows. And it might have to do with him being the master of Care Bear Stairs. Master of Care Bear Stairs. 
it is a good thing that I am not running for office. We quickly find out that this broad Nami is some kind of obsessed weirdo with great tits who wants Kimura to document that fine body of hers for the jerk off mag. You know, typical lady stuff. It's not long before Nami is sowing discord amongst our trio and we start to learn more about her history with these pervert periodicals and the dark truth behind all of it. Also lots of piss, like so much urine. Cinema. There's a lot to appreciate here. As I said, it's got a lot to do with the industry itself and presenting scenarios as extensions of that. So for peeing scenes, it's all set up for shooting and then when tying up Mako and a cross for a little bondage photography, once again, we're shown the process itself. It's not anything more than an excuse for the mandatory sex and nudity, but the extra effort to create variety is, you know, always appreciated. At least one of these does get a sconch of salty, but honestly at this point, what, what do you expect? Like, come on. It, it comes with the territory. Like, if you're this far into the video and you're like, what? It contains sexual assault? I, pff, I don't have to tell you, man. From a technical perspective, The Beaver Book Girl is definitely the weakest of what I've seen from the Roman porno series. It's by no means an ugly film or anything. The Katsu is pretty consistent overall, but it just doesn't feel like the best work from cinematographer Nobumasa Mizuno. I think, however, that that's mostly down to the story, which doesn't demand the ornate setups like Fairy in a Cage. His work on I Love It From Behind is similar enough to the point that Beaver Book Girl often looks like a more dour version of that aesthetic. But hey, good on them for getting this plane shot. Like, that is, hmm. Anytime I see a plane, uh, when I'm like going down the strip, all I think about. Plane shots, not molestation. Uh, there's plenty of effort here, just more subdued than the typical Roman porno. Um, side note, I love that this Jaws shirt is hunky-dory, but whatever's on this one isn't. Girl got Miss Magnificented. Director Takashi Kano only worked on a handful of films as a director, though he did work on a whole bunch as an assistant director. Uh, I have no idea if that contributed to the more plain nature of this film, but interestingly, one of the six or so movies under his direction, Poaching Wife Frustrated Inside, also contains themes of female empowerment. Not to spoil too much here, but there's definitely a little, a little taking back of agency in Beaver Book Girl. Again, used as a means of satisfying the male gaze, but as far as I know, not a necessity. I guess to be totally fair, it doesn't really turn out too bad for the dude, but whatever. Again, I'll take what I can get. Beaver Book Girl is definitely on the less memorable side of things in this batch, but there's still a lot to recommend. The use of music in the big fuck marathon near the end is rad as hell. Uh, the piss scenes are frankly hilarious. Like, look at that thing go. And Junko Mabuki as Nami is a treat to watch. Plus, again, I love the industry angle. I think given, um, you know, just a bit more of that side of things and some more exciting camera work, we'd pretty easily have a classic of the genre. As it stands, it's good, but you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with good. I am, I am more than happy for a movie called Zoom Up the Beaver Book Girl <laughs> to just be good. <laughs> Moving on. All right, Love Hunter, Love Hunter, Love Hunter. All right. Perfect. Okay, so there's a lot here we could finish out with. There's the uh, ama-oriented horny diver type shellfish, the grody sounding woman in a box, virgin sacrifice, and of course the extremely subtle sexual assaults at a hotel. However, I think we should, at very least, end with the one other film with the Blu-ray in this collection, Love Hunter. Much like Fairy in a Cage, this one is a real fucking downer, but it also continues our theme of variety. Love Hunter is essentially a psychodrama about an older woman with some serious mental issues due to seeing her mother assaulted by her grandfather, which, yeah, fair enough. This woman, Kyoko, has a sexual relationship with her cousin and winds up taking an interest in innocent young couple Hisako and Kazuo, the former played by Marie Tanaka, who became a bit of a star after this one. 
Uh, from a historical perspective, Love Hunter is kind of a landmark film. It's very early in the Roman porno cycle, released in 1972. Uh, for context, the series started on November 20th, 1971, with the one-two punch of Apartment Wife, Affair in the Afternoon, and Castle Orgies. Uh, what a double feature. Uh, 1972 saw the release of just over 60 Roman pornos, with Love Hunter being one of the earliest, released on January 18th. It was also the second time Nakatsu wound up in trouble with Japanese law enforcement over one of their films violating Japan's public obscenity law. The first was 1965's Black Snow, but this time things really blew up, with a whole bunch of people uh, associated with the release brought in to stand trial. And it wasn't until 1980 that the whole kerfuffle ended in a not guilty verdict. Sadly, this debacle put an end to director Saichiro Yamaguchi's career. His last two films were 1973's Love Hunter Desire, also known as Love Hunter Lust, which features a public obscenity case in the same vein as what he was going through at the time, and a 1977 biopic also produced by Nakatsu and featuring Marie Tanaka. It's a sad turn of events because Love Hunter suggests quite a bit of skill on Yamaguchi's side, though a huge shout out has to be made to Shohei Endo, uh, who also shot Nagasaki Butterfly in 1972 and knocked it out of the fucking park two years later with Flower and Snake, which is an absolute fucking just pinnacle of the genre. Uh, he also shot 1997's Full Metal Yakuza for Takashi Miike, which, you know, not highly regarded, but Miike. He also shot future subject of this channel and prestige director Kohei Oguri's Academy Award nominated Muddy River. So, uh, noise pedigree, you know? Here, he really just kicks ass left, right, and center. Every shot is strong, and nearly every one, at least all the wides, are perfectly composed. Lots of framing using windows and various architectural quirks, and depth using foreground objects like a rad rotating statue. Artsy touches like lights going out in the club at the end of a scene, or Baba-esque gelled lighting, stuff like that. This is the coolest looking sex club I've ever seen. I don't go to a lot of them, I just... I watch a lot of movies that feature them. Plot-wise, Love Hunter is somewhat complicated, with lots of drama and subtle plot mechanics to keep track of, but it's also an engaging, sort of erotic thriller. Where it falters is in placing those mandated sex scenes. Uh, not that the scenes themselves are bad, they're not, but in how that plus the just over an hour runtime makes them feel rushed. Uh, it's a common issue with the pink genre, and one that trips up Love Hunter from time to time. The character who most suffers from this is Kazuo, who just feels like a giant asshole throughout the whole thing, and his arc is absolutely not satisfying. It's actually almost anger-inducing. Why Hisako would stay with him is never clear, and it seems as if the plot should be that she uses her agency to throw this piece of shit to the side. That is not what happens. Uh, therefore, her arc is muted by her boyfriend's actions, and although she grows from her initial Puritan schoolgirl aesthetic into something more complicated, it rings a little hollow because, well, Fuck that guy. Fuck yourself. However, if you take all of it as an exercise in Sadian plot mechanics, it's fairly easy to look past and enjoy all the positives. Hell, just visually, it's a treat. And considering the term Roman porno comes from a French term meaning pornographic novel, or at least that's supposedly where it comes from, uh, itself a label for works by such luminaries as the Marquis de Sade, it feels appropriate to reflect on that off-sided writer's influence on the genre. Like with all the other nasty business, it kinda comes with the territory. And honestly, if you look at this Blu-ray, or this DVD, or this Blu-ray, or this Blu-ray, or this DVD, or this DVD, and expect a lighthearted romp? Son, that's on you. All said and done, Nakatsu released around 850 Roman porno titles from 1971 to 1988, with 710 of those 710, made by their production arm and the rest through contracts with smaller studios. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I've got a lot of smut in my future. Wait, what? Go watch a movie.
think I'll review all of Jess Franco's filmography.